Hello Ted Williams. Um, we're very fortunate today to find you at your home and ask a few questions. Questions that have been compiled on your very own tedwilliams.com board as well as Westeros. And yeah, we'll be talking about obviously The Last King of Osnard, your upcoming series, and well other stuff as well. Um, I'm reading out the question. Well, the first question, I will take it from there, okay? That's fine. Okay. So, the, these are two that go together, so I ask them both and you answer. Um, how has the maturation of the genre in the past 20 years influenced your own craft? Particularly as you were on the forefront of that maturation with ms &T. What is, What has changed now? And the other one, which is quite similar, originally Memory Sower and Thorn was meant to be a commentary to the Lord of the Rings. In the 30 years that passed since fantasy became mainstream, what impact does the development of the genre has on your new books? Okay, well, yeah, both questions are about the changes in the genre. Well, first off, um, I have to say I'm probably not the best person to ask because the nature of what I do means I probably read less fantasy fiction than most fantasy readers. Um, about 60-70% or more of what I read is non-fiction, um, mostly research, although I read a lot of non-fiction just because it interests me. So I am not that caught up on a lot of what's going on in the genre. Obviously I've read you know George Martin stuff and Steven Erickson and various other folks, but I do not consider myself to be anywhere near an expert. That said, that is, it is certainly true that when I first started, one of the reasons that I wrote the, um, the Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn books was because I felt there was, um, in the early 70s and 80s, uh, in the 70s and 80s there was a lot of stuff being written that to me was fairly clearly being written by people who did not who wanted to, to read more Tolkien-esque fantasy, but didn't necessarily understand that Tolkien was not setting out um, guidelines for writing fantasy. He was not saying, this is how fantasy is. He was actually writing a very personal set of books. The Lord of the Rings are very personal, and they're very personal to Tolkien. But a lot of the people that came along after him just sort of automatically took that stuff almost as holy writ. You know, that, okay, well, we're, we're not going to do the, um, the kind of Victorian, back to Shakespearean idea of elves. We're going to go back to an earlier, more northern idea of elves as these faintly frightening, beautiful creatures instead of little tiny things, you know, riding around on the backs of bumblebees and stuff, you know. <laughs> and that was very much Tolkien's own decision, and, and he despised that kind of idea of, of fairies and stuff. But a lot of people who came along after, especially when fantasy became so popular in the 60s and 70s, a lot of people who came along afterward kind of didn't get that. You know, they were looking at Tolkien as being sort of, these are the rules now for fantasy. And that drove me nuts because I was a, you know, I was a Tolkien enthusiast and I knew where it came from and I knew a lot of his source material. And I wanted to do a similar kind of book and, and choose my own source material and tell my own story. Also, and this is still talking about my original stuff, when I was writing those books, um, I, I also very much wanted to comment on Tolkien himself. Not, again, because I wanted to say something critical or anything like that, but just because I wanted to say, you know, again, this was personal to him. Most fantasy of that era all kind of uses certain tropes or whatever you want to call it about things like oh the golden age you know when everything was great back in the past and then you know it, everything now in the present when the story is taking place is all messed up and it's humans and it's not elves anymore and blah, you know and which is fine as an idea but it, the idea again that it's wholly writ never worked for me for one thing Tolkien was a very different writer and a very different person than I was Tolkien was, um, you know, an Oxford Don in philology. He was a Catholic, um, both of which I definitely am not. I am not religious, and I am not an Oxford Don. So, um, you know, he he really didn't like things like electric lights, you know, and cars, and all these things that had ruined his Oxford. And you can see this reverence for the past all through his book. 
and also obviously the idea of a fallen world is the you know is Christian doctrine. It's the heart of Catholicism. It's the idea of original sin. I don't believe that. I never was raised in that tradition. So if you look at my first books, they're very much about how many of these things that are sort of part of Tolkien's holy writ, I actually kind of play with. I set them up as though it's going to be the same, and then it explodes later on. The golden age is not very golden, and things like that. Um, but then, so since that time, I was, I, and I was, so I, I thought people would realize that, and, and I didn't get many people who actually noticed I was trying to write commentary, and I, to, to, uh, to be fair, I, I do try to write a story so that it's a story first, and everything else is secondary. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't. I hope nobody would ever pick my book up, one of my books up, and go, "Oh, it's commentary on another writer." You know, <laughs> so I do always try to make it story first. But one of the things that has happened since that time is not so much. I think that the field has has changed in and of itself, but I think that a lot of very good writers have begun to move into fantasy in the same way that they moved into science fiction in, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and began to expand what science fiction could be. And I think because what we think of as fantasy is a more recent genre than science fiction, mm -hmm. it only started happening when people, not just me, but other people came along. Uh, George Martin just being the most, one of the more recent. Um, and in general, writers have begun to go into it with a, a, a different mindset. And it's just in the same way with science fiction, that, that people went from all science fiction has to be about white military men saving the universe, and then other ideas began to creep in, you know, and what are aliens really like, and would we recognize them, and what if the taking Americanism out into the cosmos is not the best idea, uh, and, you know, in the same way these things have crept into fantasy just because more writers have come in and brought new viewpoints. So I hope I've been part of it. but. I myself have been so intensely involved with my own books that I'm not really watching for trends. Um, I, I, I'm kind of oblivious to them, as a matter of fact. My wife, Deborah, occasionally is, I think, slightly irritated with me by how much I don't care about what other writers are doing because, if anything, I've become more enmeshed in my own interests and in what I care about, and I've become more like myself as a writer every year that's gone by. So, if anything, um, I, you know, I think I'm more oblivious to the outside world. There could be people writing almost anything out in the world of fantasy, and I would still be writing what I like best. And, but what I, what I think has happened, and what I hope has happened, is that there are now more people out there who like the kind of thing that I like, and I'm, that's who I'm writing for. Okay, so let us go into last King of Ops. Now, is there anything you can share already, content-wise, character-wise, conflict-wise, what it'll be about? Well, the whole idea, anybody who knows me or has followed my career knows that I had, up until a couple of years ago, I had always said, I have no intention of writing a sequel to anything I've already written, not because I'm opposed to it, but because the idea has to come first. I don't want to just do a franchise like, hey, this would be a good spot to open another Tad Williams Golden Arches, you know? <laughs> what I need to do is to write, to find a story I want to write. And as I always said, if I ever come up with such a story idea and it's in a universe that I've already created, that's fine. And actually, again, talking of, of my lovely wife, um, I was telling Deborah at one point a few years ago, you know, no, I can't just write another Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn, you know, and she said, well, why not? I said, because I, the way that my brain works, I must have an idea. And for some reason, I went away from that conversation and, and was like making lists in my mind, you know, of all the ways I could explain to Deb about why I couldn't just write another story. And in the course of doing that, I started to think about, well, you know, what would I want to write about if I went back to this world? I'm 30 years on, you know, I'm a different person than when I wrote these books. I, I've remarried, I have a completely different life, I have children, I'm a homeowner, I'm a professional full-time writer, all these things that are different. 
And then suddenly, you know, there was like this little sputter, sputter flash and the light bulb went off over my head. And I said, well, that's what it's about. Mm -hmm. It's about how has this world changed during the, the, the length of, you know, a part of somebody's lifetime. Where all these characters that were tropes of fantasy that I was working with, like the young apprentice type who grows up to become somebody important, the disaffected princess, the, you know, all of these characters, we just left them at that age. Well, what if we project 30 years into the future? You know, now they've been the rulers for 30 years. They've had children of their own. They've experienced the world and begun to realize that some parts are less wonderful than they imagined, some other parts are better than they could have hoped, you know, um, that they have been fully immersed in mortality and humanity. Who would the new characters be? What happened to the older characters? All of a sudden I had the beginnings of a way to think about a new story. And that's where it sprang from for me. So what readers will see in The Last King of Ostinard is a return to Ostinard during the, the lifetime of the main characters but we will also now be looking at it from a variety of new angles that we hadn't seen before as well. So not only will we see the characters who are the main characters again, but as older and different people, we'll see new young characters as well, but we'll also see things like the Norns who are sort of, for those who haven't read my book, I'll say they're kind of the bad fairies or the bad elves. Um, they, are the, they have been the enemy in the first set of books. While they're still the enemy, we will see the world from their point of view for the first time. So there's a lot more attention given to, to who they are and what, how they think and, and what their societies are like and why they hate the mortals so much. So there are a number of different ways like this that I've found to get into the story at different angles to reveal new aspects of the history of this very complicated world and universe that I'd invented. So what people are going to see is, on some levels, the same kind of stories in terms of the depth and the complexity and, I hope, entertaining and interesting characters, but they will also see all of these things from much different angles and it, over time. They will find out how the world has changed. They will learn about people that before were merely ideas and not fully fleshed out because they were only seen from a distance. So there's a lot of things that will be the same but different. So I gather that the world is expanding, there are more points of view and more things to come. This fits with one question very well. Um, will Nescandu or the ancient southern empire Candia feature in the new book? Those, those things that were only hinted at, yeah, there yeah, are loads yeah. of little things. Yeah. Will we learn more about that? We absolutely will in both of those cases. but. Not necessarily that because we'll literally spend time there or anything like that, but yes, absolutely. And one of the things that I want to talk about, for instance, and both of those things have a lot to do with it, is the geographical isolation of the first set of books where we everything happened in these countries that we call Ostinard, but we never really found out why there aren't any outside countries mm -hmm. that are that we are exposed yeah, to and things like that. Yeah, there's a lot of talk about that. Exactly. Yeah. So there will be a lot of, not a lot of stuff, but there will be stuff in this book about that and whether that's changing or not, whether there is an outside world or what happened to the world before the first books that made it that way. So there will be information about that, but there will be a lot of things like that also which were only seen in passing which we will learn more about. We won't necessarily learn everything about them, but there will definitely be things like that and certainly those two that we will learn more about.